local institutions of higher education, or colleges, universities, and community colleges are significant community assets. They contribute enormously to the identity and quality of the place where we all live, work, and play. And York is fortunate to have several institutions, and what has been very exciting over the past few years is to see their level of engagement increase and their presence extend beyond campus boundaries, particularly into York City. We're very privileged to have two representatives from York College of Pennsylvania with us today, Dr. Dominic Deli Carpini and Dr. Ken Martin, who have been actively leading these efforts for York College. They will be speaking to us about <coughs> constructing engaging spaces, locations which invite collaboration among campus and community stakeholders, encourage hands-on learning opportunities for students, and provide good reasons for members of York College faculty and students to spend quality time within the community. Dr. Della Carpini is the Dean of York College's Center for Community Engagement, the Naylor Endowed Professor of Writing Studies, and President of the National Council of Writing Program Administrators. Domina currently lives in Dallas Town, but was born on Long Island, grew up in Braintree, Massachusetts, then lived in Wayne, Pennsylvania before attending the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia where he received his BA in English and then received his Master's and PhD in English from Penn State University. Before taking on his current role, he served your college for five years as Dean of Academic Affairs and 13 years as Writing Program Director. He has received the York College Professional Service Award and earlier this morning, the York County Economic Alliance Spirit of York County Award for Community Engagement. Now you may know all of that, but what perhaps what you did not know was that Dr. Della Carpini has owned two small businesses, a cafe and bakery at the Jersey Shore called Sticky Fingers Pastry Parlor, which he owned and operated for 10 summers in the late uh, in the 1980s, but also teaching in the Catholic high schools in Philadelphia. And he also owned a discount women's clothing outlet in the late 1970s, which helped finance his college education. And Dominic also told me that his father only had a sixth grade education, his mother had a high school education, and yet four of their five children earned doctorates, and three went on to become deans. Dr. Ken Martin is the vice president of campus operations at York College. His career is focused on community collaboration and economic development in international, rural, and now urban settings. And all three of Dr. Martin's degrees are from Penn State, a BS in Ag Economics, a Master's in Rural Sociology, with a PhD in Rural Sociology, and a minor <coughs> in Economics. Ken was instrumental in helping develop the streetscape improvements along West Jackson Street, in completing the rail trail enhancements from your college to downtown, and played a key role in your college's recent acquisition of two downtown locations to bring together the city and the campus community. He chairs the Urban Landscape Committee of Downtown Inc., <coughs> is active with Crispus Attics Real Estate, and serves as President Commissioner of Upper Allen Township. You may have already known all of that, but you may not know that Ken and his wife, Yvonne, <coughs> He retired after 34 years as a business professor at Messiah College. They live in mechanics in the Mechanicsburg area. You may not know that Ken grew up on a northeastern Lancaster County family farm, raising beef, hogs, tobacco, and he graduated from Garden Spot High School in New Holland. And being a farm boy, he was the state FFA, Future Farmers of America, president, and Ken continues to be a Pennsylvania licensed auctioneer. How's that for community engagement? <laughs> so please welcome Dr. Dominic <coughs> Deli Carpini and Dr. <coughs> Ken Martin. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here. I appreciate your giving us some time to tell you a little bit about the work we're doing at York College. By the way, that, that bakery I had at the shore made more money in 10 weeks than uh, the other 40 weeks of the year I was teaching in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> so we'll begin, um, let me see. I want to begin with a little bit of the, uh, the theory 
of why we, uh, why we are uh, doing what we're doing at your college. And uh, John Dewey, who was a, a, pragmatic, a pragmatist philosopher and education expert, uh, wrote about 100 years ago about the state of education in America and talked a lot about the disconnect between the world around those schools and the schools themselves. And it took us quite a long time to start to listen to that pragmatic view of education and the need to reconnect schools uh, with the culture around it. And it is something that has influenced a lot of the work that Ken and I have been doing over the years, <clears throat> that students need to be able to apply what they're learning in school to their daily lives. I will go on to say also that, uh, as Dewey talked about uh, the problem with school, or what he called the waste in school, he said this, when the child gets into the schoolroom, he has to put out of his mind a large part of the ideas, interests, and activities that predominate in his home and neighborhood. That is, what the students saw was an isolation between the school and the, and the larger environment. He also, and, and I'm not going to go over this diagram in any detail, but really what, what Dewey was talking about is the need to see a porous uh, boundary between the school and the culture around it especially uh, the business world around it. Um, it was really important to him to have the students think about why they're learning what they're learning all the way through. One of my favorite stories about Dewey was he talked about visiting a, a classroom, social studies classroom in Moline, uh, Illinois, and they were learning about the Mississippi River, and no one mentioned that outside the window was the Mississippi River. <laughs> and in many ways, that's, that's sometimes what we've seen in this medieval view of education we began with. So I'm going to turn it over to Ken to talk a little bit about some of that history. So many of the learning spaces that we're probably familiar with look similar to this one where we had rows of desks and the instructor in the front of the room and people individually working at a desk and studying. We still have some of those spaces on campus, <coughs> but it's really, really changed and we want to show you some of the uh, spaces that we've developed in order to actually engage students and create a collaborative learning experience. Thank you. The, the difference between what you saw on that last slide where the students were in rows is not just the fact that they're organized in that way, but it's actually the relationship they hold with their teacher or professor in this case. It's different when you have someone in front of you like I am here talking to you than it is when, in this case, the professor is standing in a biology lab with these students working with them and they solve problems together. So the spaces on our campus we're trying to construct are all about collaborative learning. So that with that professor standing behind the students, supporting the students, what you see is the students put in charge of their own learning and also motivated to learn because it is up to them to solve problems. The spaces really do dictate the way students learn. Um, if you, you know, those of us who have taught in traditional classrooms know that the back row is usually where people gather, usually wearing baseball caps, and stay, sit in the back and think they cannot be engaged in what's going on. We need to disrupt that, and that's what we're trying to do with our classrooms. So spaces look very, very differently today. <coughs> Excuse me. And so you will find that students are gathered in smaller groups, they're more interactive, and the space is much more informal than it might have been heretofore. The construction process, or the way we go about developing that space, differs immensely. In the olden days, when I first started my career, generally you chose an architect who probably assumed that they knew best what the learning experience should be. You put together some plans along with the other professionals, you put it out to bid and you hired a contractor and you built the space and then, aha, you brought the students in and this was the space that they were going to learn. Not so today. We have found that the construction process really involves planning, <coughs> planning, planning, planning. And I like to suggest that it, you should spend as much time <coughs> planning a project as it takes to actually build it. And the way that you can really be successful is if you involve the end user, in this case the student and the instructor in that process to demonstrate what it is that they really want to do in that room and what their preferences are. Uh, whiteboards, blackboards, fixed furniture, movable furniture, uh, hardwired, Wi-Fi, what, whatever the attributes and assets in that classroom experience or in that learning experience that they benefit from, you better make sure that that's in fact 
the case. For instance, if you've been to our campus, the, Wil the Wilman Business Center has everything from small seminar spaces to traditional classrooms to informal areas where you can move furniture to a high-tech finance lab, areas where you can gather with 250 students in large groups, and so it's a whole collaboration of uh, experiences within that building. I might add, that was one of the most challenging and fun jobs that I've been involved in in that we never missed a class while we constructed during that 18-month period. Quite challenging. Another example, if you've not yet visited the York Country Day School and you've met some of our students earlier, that again was a project where we paid very specific attention to what kind of learning experiences the students wanted to be involved in along with their instructors. And that's a state-of-the-art, technologically savvy building that really does provide the environment for learning. Thank you, Ken. So the other thing that is important in learning is that it is allowed to be messy at times. The, the, the first slide you saw with the students sitting in rows with their shirts and ties doesn't allow the students to actually play. And what's interesting about that is you see two, sli two pictures on this slide. One is of our uh, Kinsley Engineering Center. The other is our Market View Arts Building downtown. And in both of those spaces, artists, scientists, they are both working in a similar kind of environment where they have stuff around them everywhere, where they can pick and choose the materials that are going to help them solve problems, and that they can figure out not only in their head, but with their hands, what it is they're really trying to build, what they're trying to create, and what they want, what they are creating to do. That comes again from the kinds of collaborative work that Ken was talking about. And I've had the opportunity in, in my previous role to sit in a room with architects like Frank, with, uh, you know, some of the construction companies here in town, uh, along with faculty colleagues and other administrators, where we shared ideas to develop this. So we didn't imagine spaces, but we imagined activities first. And here you can see the kinds of activities that drove what uh, Ken and his team were able to develop in that Kinsley Engineering Center. Another interesting project uh, we had, we heard from our student who was into uh, robotics. Simulation is a big thing within uh, learning nowadays as well. And uh, I'm always, uh, I was involved in the nursing simulation labs in Deal Hall about, uh, oh gosh, it might be 10 years now, but I always kind of like this idea. I would rather have a prospective medical student practice on a, a, a mannequin rather than a human being. But it, it, it's really neat because people can be relaxed and they can learn and the instructor can create different experiences and different scenarios by which the student can react to. This was a fun project in that we took an existing building, repurposed some space, and made it into a tank technologically uh, superb space with simulation labs by visiting other places that had laboratories and trying to get the best practices and ideas and put it together in this which is now state-of-the-art uh, equipment and learning right here in York. A more recent example was the ability to have hands-on just like the nursing students uh, or working with, with mannequins as a simulation experience. Our hospitality students are working in a licensed commercial kitchen downtown so that they can actually procure, prepare, and serve food and get the entire experience uh, as they work. So it's learning the business right on campus or in their learning setting so that they're prepared with real life experiences as they leave our campus. In both of those cases, the nursing example and the hospitality example, um, the interesting thing is the, the, the stress level. Uh, there was a study done at the nursing simulation. The stress level of the students <coughs> is equivalent to stress levels of nurses working in the hospital while they're doing that. That is, they're learning to make decisions under the same kinds of stress levels they would see on the job. So that's why simulation works so well. So here, in this case, the simulation is uh, simulation in a business environment. Two spaces, one a conference room, where students need to sit around a table, dressed properly for a business, uh, you know, for a business environment, and speak to one another face to face. Something we lose a bit of in a current technological environment. 
But the, to the right is a slide of our NASDAQ trading lab. Um, and that NASDAQ trading lab allows students to make on-the-spot decisions about the kinds of trading they will do based upon the news and other kinds of things with a live feed that will help them understand why they should make these kind of decisions. Recently, though, a fund was established for the students to actually invest real money, and it's doing better than the college investment. <laughs> Although we're not in trading today, so don't send us any of your money for those purposes right now. Uh. So we realized, though, that there was one more step to make, and that is that there needed to be real organic connections with the community itself. Simulation still remains simulation. Our latest step that Ken and I have had the opportunity to work together with, with along with the, the whole York College community, is to now say simulation into the actual environments around us to find that organic connection, as Dewey called it, between the environment uh, around us and the school. And this brings us to our latest development where we're actually having learning experiences right in the community in downtown York. And I've been uh, fortunate enough to be a part of, the, of that. In one case, taking a facility that was developed by the Industrial Development Authority and now is our Market View Arts uh, building across from uh, Central Market and then 59 East Market Street which was referenced earlier and taking a historic building and repurposing that so that we can use it for uh, a multiple uh, environment with multiple learning experiences and I'm really proud of York and one of the things I like working at this institution is that they don't necessarily build new and or acquire a facility and say okay we have to start over but on our main campus as well as downtown we've taken existing buildings renovated and repurposed them keeping the existing architect and some of the historic flair but making it <coughs> modern day learning experiences and so this was uh, lots of fun and if you've not yet been to 59 East Market Street visit it on a first Friday and or uh, I think we're having an official opening uh, later next month So in a space like this, this is the example from the Center for Community Engagement building, uh, the process moves as students learn to cook in the basement, but more importantly, in that commercial kitchen, learn to plan, as Ken was saying, out an entire event. So they price it out, they figure out what they need, they develop it. This example was one of our, uh, our events called Dinner with 12 Spartans. And what these students were able to do is plan out a menu, to work on that menu, to work with their professors to say, what would the space look like? How do I set up the table? And then finally, people were seated around, enjoyed a meal. What the students learn who will be managers in hospitality sites is from soup to nuts, literally, what it is they need to develop when they are creating an event out there in the world by having done it. Equally true for our artists in the Market View Arts facility, they learn the process from creation all the way to presentation. Our goal is to turn out artists that also understand the business of art and understand how to present, how to curate, and how to work through uh, the various elements of, of, uh, of actually selling their art. Two other things that uh, really involve the community and give students real life experiences on the uh Let's see, your right-hand side, the uh, uh, Kingsville Depot, where we have the J.D. <coughs> Brown Center for Entrepreneurship, where students and other community members can come together, look at ideas, create them, and actually start a business. And I'm not sure where the county is now, but there are multiple businesses that have been incubated and started right in this center and then moved out to be viable businesses in the community. A great opportunity for students to partner with community members and uh, get their ideas into an actual business. Uh, the other is an exciting project that's underway now with the Graham Innovation uh, Zone where we've taken a, a space that was a snack bar and then later a classroom and now it's going to be a design uh, space and kind of a think tank area creating space uh, for our students and it will be open, it is already open I guess this semester. Uh, and then this is an example of uh, really involving students from day one, and that is that we have Spartan Central down in uh, Central Market. Some of you have visited that. But the exciting thing about this is that our students had an opportunity to be involved from 
the very beginning of looking at the space, thinking about how it could be recreated into a business, coming up with a business plan of what kinds of inventory and materials they wanted to sell there, what kind of markups they wanted to uh, bin, how they're going to staff it. And so this is really an example of a student-run business from conception until now it's a, a viable operating business. So exciting stuff, and it's all in downtown York, which gives us the advantage of having students interacting with people beyond our campus boundary. So to wrap up, I want to say that the, the ultimate goal is to bring these students to you as, as experienced workers, as people that are ready to take on the kinds of roles you need and to truly innovate. And, and then we just have a couple of minutes, I think, left for some questions, so I want to stop there and, and, and uh, give you that opportunity. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Do, do either of you have a, have a theory as to why the, the quotations you brought from, from Dewey and so forth, why educational institutions, at least in my experience, have ignored that for decades? <laughs> it's actually, I mean, when do, e even when Dewey wrote about it, he called it the medieval conception of, 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 of education. It, 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 educational institutions are notoriously slow to change. Um, and I think for many reasons, we're changing now because of the environment we're in. That is, up until now, we were the only way, only ticket into the middle or upper, upper class. That is not the case anymore. We're not the only game in town anymore. There are many ways to become educated, and now we're forced to innovate, and that's when people do it, I think. That's, that's my, I don't know. Yes? The new initiative on the drawing board that you can talk about? Any new initiatives that we can talk about? Uh, we're going to keep growing and we're going to keep changing because I think that's really what you have to do. Is th and it may not be necessarily in size or all all these new facilities, but learning is changing and technology is becoming more important. And as we believe that collaboration between the outside world and campus, as well as with between students and with students and professors, so. Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we do have a strategic plan for uh, for the next five years, and so we've been reviewing that. And I think that uh, our 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 stress will be on uh, learning and uh, moderate growth. One more question. Yes. <coughs> Yeah, I actually think that this is this is a trend that you do see nationally. I think more and more colleges are thinking about the ways in which they can involve the students in hands-on learning. I think we do it better than most for a number of reasons. One is this has always been part of our DNA. We've always been a college that actually stresses getting people into the workforce and doing that well. Others are trying to catch up. Larger universities trying to find their way back to that kind of hands-on learning. Smaller liberal arts colleges trying to figure out how they blend that with Work, workforce. We've done that really well together, I think. I think we do it better. I'm biased, but I think we do it earlier. If you look, uh, some of the initiatives that have taken place at York College, the simulation lab in nursing, the uh, finance lab with a NASDAQ ticker, uh, when Dr. Gunter Smith came and, and saw the vision to really incorporate what we're doing in campus with downtown and, and bridging that gap. Uh, things like buying property, right, having assets in the community. Uh, there are other institutions that are in the region aspiring to do that, but I think if you look at our history, we tend to be out front and maybe incorporate that change earlier. We do have the advantage of being a private institution, so our change can be a bit more uh, responsive and quick than perhaps a public institution. 